everybody. Be Thursday. We're back, back again. I made it just by the skin of my teeth, but I'm here. We're going to talk about toxic people. Welcome to Ass Arena Live. Let me turn this around. Hello. Let me adjust myself. Hello, thank you for joining. Hi, Kimberly. I think that was Suarez Geo H. Crawford. Wow, thank you for joining. I think I saw Dom Tillman join as well. Thank you for inviting followers. I appreciate it. Welcome, welcome. This is Ask Sarina Live. This is my weekly talk show that I do every week at 11 p.m. And it is my attempt to talk about everything. Everything from the world of work to relationships to parenting, you name it, I'm going to cover it. And so I'm so glad that you guys are here. So I'm going to say a hello to all my live viewers and my replay viewers. There's quite a few of you that have been jumping on after the fact, and I appreciate you as well. So a little bit about me. I am Janine Truitt. I am the Chief Innovations Officer for Talent Think Innovations, LLC based in Port Jefferson Station, New York. And my business is a multidisciplinary business strategy firm where I focus on HR and talent management strategy, uh, digital marketing strategy, executive coaching, and just overall business strategy advisement for women-owned firms as well as tech firms. So that's a little bit about my business. And obviously Kimberly, my lovely digital media intern has just popped my website into the chat box. If you obviously are interested in anything that I do, you can certainly visit. I would welcome it. So tonight, we're talking about toxic relationships. And I have to say that this is a topic that's near and dear to my heart because I'm actually living it. Um, I've been living it for a while, but um, I'm actually living it. Like I feel like I'm at the end, the tail end of fully cleaning out people who just don't deserve to be in my circle. And funny enough, when I was talking about this topic with Kimberly, who is my intern, by the way, um, we both just concurred like, wow, this is so real. This is so, so real. Amen. Yes. Um, so for me, I've literally been on this journey for like, I want to say, what are we in 2016? It's been about 10 years of cleaning out. Like that probably sounds like a lot, but it's been about 10 years since about 2006. I've been kind of weeding people out little by little. So we'll get into it. So much to say, but before I get into it and forget, um, there are always articles that inform our discussions or articles that I feel are um, worthy of you reading so that you can kind of see like if there's anything that I missed or if there's just anything that's even helpful to you in general. And so I have two good ones tonight. Um, the first one is called Toxic Relationships and that's by HealthScope. Um, the other one is by HuffPost and it is when you realize a relationship is toxic and it needs to end. So just a little background on each article. The Toxic Relationships article is phenomenal. It literally breaks down these different types of toxic people so that it's very clear from the beginning who you may be dealing with. And I mean, when I tell you they're spot on, they are spot on. So I really enjoyed that article. Um, HuffPost is also great. It's great from the standpoint of... Um, kind of helping you understand why it's necessary to get rid of toxic people. And for me, I felt when I was reading it that it made me feel a little bit at peace with the decision to get rid of some people. And I and I guess they also address friends and family. Family can be very touchy and we'll talk about that. It can be very, very touchy to deal with toxic family members and actually having to do something about it. So that's the synopsis on both of the articles. They're really, really good. Um, certainly take a look at them. 
So I want to set up the conversation. Um, as I said, the toxic relationships article was really good. And I wanted to just kind of give you some buckets to throw some people in in your life if you're dealing with this. So in the article, they give us about, I want to say about 10 different buckets with which to throw people into. There's like 10 different types of toxic people. So here they are. Um, the first one is the deprecator and belittler. That's the one that kind of puts you down. You can do nothing great. Those are the ones that kind of embarrass you in front of people just because they never want to show that you are good at anything. They're always putting you down. You never have a good idea. Those. Deprecator, belittler. Then you have the bad tempers, and those are just the crazies that just don't know how to control themselves, and they fly off the handle for any reason, and so they're teetering on abusive, right? I've had a few of those. The guilt inducer. So these are the ones that, you know, every time you come to them with some kind of issue, they somehow find a way to insert some guilt into it, you know, by maybe you know, making you understand what they're going through and they kind of go through that whole bit to kind of guilt trip you. They're always the victim. I know a few of those as well. The overreactor and deflector. For me, this is probably the more annoying one of them all is this overreactor and deflector because they kind of are like a mix of bad temper and guilt inducer in the sense that they fly off the handle, they get super angry for whatever it is you're telling them. And you can be just as calm as I'm speaking right now, but they will fly off the handle and they will find some way to turn what you've said into something that completely has nothing to do with what your issue is with them. And so that's the deflector part. They annoy the crap out of me. And I have about one to two of these people in my life, one of which is not always like that. And so I'm probably inclined to deal with it. But this is probably the more annoying toxic person for me personally. Then you have the overdependent. So I thought that was interesting. This is the person who they're saying is toxic but in a very passive way. They're toxic in the sense that you're always having to do stuff for them. They're very not independent. They just always very needy, needy, needy people. So I've known the over-dependent too. And we'll talk about how I just didn't see it. They're, they're hard to detect. And I find that when you're a nice person, and I'd like to think I am, um, it's just a little difficult to see them for who they are because they come very nice and very generous and they seem to be good people and pleasant. But in time, um, you see that you're the only one kind of putting an effort in the relationship and that's an issue. Then you have the independent. So this is the person that is completely not dependable. So it doesn't matter what you ask them on what day. They'll always tell you, yeah, 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 I can do it, I can do it, I got you, no problem. But do they do it? Do they do anything that they say they're going to do? Not at all. Those people annoy me as well. I haven't, I can't say that I've had too much to do with these kinds, um, but I can definitely see it. The user is the next one. So next to the overreactor and deflector, the user annoys the crap out of me. And that's actually what I'm dealing with now as a user or an opportunist in my head. And it just, I hate a user. I hate a user. And um, these people are also very difficult to kind of detect because of the way they approach you, the way they approach things. They're very also, in the article, they say, you know, very pleasant very nice, usually very nice people, um, but they're here to take. And if they're nice and if they're giving you something, they're not giving you something because they really want you to have it or because they're really trying to be helpful. It's always kind of in their head, well, if I do this for you, then you'll do this for me. It's a tit for tat. And 
I don't really like those kind of people either. And then the last one is the possessive paranoid. So this, um, they came at more of from a uh, relationship, like romantic relationship standpoint. That person is basically somebody that's just damn well crazy. Hey, Lataria, that's the one that's going through your phone, even though you're a good guy or a good gal or whatever, and you're doing your thing. Hey, girl. And they just don't believe. Anytime you leave the house, they're calling your phone a gazillion times. Anytime they see you speaking to somebody, surely you're in a relationship with them. Um, possessive paranoid. I know a few of those too. Not necessarily me, but I know of them and I can see how that would be very toxic as well. So here's the thing for me. Like, I don't think, I think I always had an aversion to toxicity, but I, I'm realizing that when I was younger, I think I was not really looking at it like through the same lens that I'm looking at it now. So that is like in my 20s. I think I was a lot more open to dealing with toxicity than I am now in my like mid 30s. I just have no damn patience for nonsense. And I guess to like, as you get older, your priorities change. Like obviously I'm married now, I have three kids, I have a house, I've got bills, a business, you know, the gamut. And so I guess you just get tired of nonsense. Um, but I always, always was kind of like the person, like I'd rather, I like quality over quantity. So I've always been that person, even though I may have been a lot more open to people's toxicity, I was always kind of very guarded about who was truly in my circle of trust. Actually, right. I have no room for it. And I actually haven't had room for it for a really long time. Um, and I think too, when life hits you over the head with certain events and things, it changes your perspective. Um, so I said in the beginning of the scope, like it was around 2006 when I started having some epiphanies about who I wanted in my life and who I didn't. And it was really because like just about a year earlier, my grandfather on my dad's side had just dropped dead, right? So like he had went to Trinidad for carnival and he had came back and everything was great and I was really close to him. And then he, you know, like two weeks later, we get this like frantic call and the man is gone, gone, dead, gone, done. And so, you know, it just was one of those things that like everything was happening. Like that death happened. I graduated college. That was happening. I moved out my house. That was happening. Was like all these different life events happened. I got engaged the very next year, like crazy. And I just reached a point, I guess I, it was almost like a breaking point for me where I was just like, you know what? I don't need the shit anymore. I don't need people's nonsense. I don't need bad people around me. Um, you know, life is too short. That was the realization. Was like, life is really too short. Like, here this man was here one day, gone the next. You know, nobody was all the wiser about anything going on with him. He seemed to be fine. So, you know, whatever. Older man, it happens. But like that happened and then we had like another family death the next year. And so it was like, one thing after the other and I was like you know what enough and you know like I said I got engaged and it's funny like people start showing their true colors around like the either the the best times in your life or the worst times in your life that's been my experience so like you know anything like weddings births um promotions uh new businesses any kind of successes or like even to death in the family, losses. And you want to see who's really, really, really down for you. Go through those things. Have a baby, get married, buy a house, start a business, you know, lose a spouse, God forbid, lose a family member, God forbid, lose your whole livelihood, God forbid, right? And see who is around. And like literally... If they're around, 
like around the clock through all of those things and they're not any of the things that I mentioned, you've got a good person. If they start showing out, toxic, toxic, toxic. So like if I go back to around my wedding, my best friend even then was just terrible. The same best friend that was so happy for me to walk down the aisle, so happy for me, was literally the worst, the scutch during the entire thing. And it was, she was, I would probably say a guilt inducer. And to this day still feels like she's owed some kind of apology for her behavior. And she's never getting it. Like it's, it's so done, it's done. Like it's never happening. But absolutely, you cannot be. And, you know, I just decided, I think, especially too, when I got married, I'm like, look, you know, my husband and I, our mantra is kind of like, we keep things in our house and we try to just keep a very zen like centered mode in our home. Sometimes I think we purposely try to prevent it. That's true. That is very true, Letaria. So for instance, like I said, in my 20s, I think I was a little bit more open to the toxicity. Like I had some people in my circle probably shouldn't have been. And I'll tell you what, mothers, mothers can see that stuff a mile away. So I had a friend and my mom was telling me for years, years, she was like, this girl's a user. She's a user. Every time she needs, right, Kimberly? Mothers can see stuff. Like I didn't want to hear her. But she just knew well in advance that this chick was not going to be true blue. And it was true. In hindsight, if I see, she really was a user. Like, anytime she needed, you know, something to do with work, I did her resume like 10 times over. I'd help her look for jobs. Anytime there was an issue, it was me, 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 me. When it came to me, try to find her. She's the kind of person that, like, when things are really going well from her for her, She'll, you'll hear from her. If things aren't going well for her, she couldn't give a rat's ass how great your life is. She's gone. She's out. She's gone. She has nothing to say. And it took me probably up, yes, ghosts real quick, <laughs> real, real quick. And it took me up until about th two to three years ago to really, really see it. And this was how. So I kind of saw all of these signs. Like I said, mom put me on. Mommy was right. But what happened was I ended up in Black Enterprise Magazine. So of course, I am very you know proud of this accomplishment. And so what do I do? I sent a text message to a bunch of my colleagues and girlfriends like, hey, I'm in Black Enterprise. You know, if you guys could pick up the magazine and support, I would greatly appreciate it, right? Fine. When I tell you every single person on that text message got back to me within minutes, if not within minutes, within hours, absolutely, girl, we will support you. You know, I'm so proud of you, blah, 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 the whole nine. Great. Except for one person, the one mommy told me about, the one that mom warned me about. Nothing. Now, granted, people are busy. I get it. I get busy. Sometimes you can't respond right away. But like, what happened the next day? What happened the week after? What happened two weeks after? What happened two months after? When I say I never heard nothing, not a peep from her. And then it dawned on me. I was like, you know what? She can't be happy for anybody unless she's in some kind of perfect space. Which she's never really in a perfect space because she makes very, very poor decisions when it comes to relationships and men and so forth. So she's never there. And if she's there, it's very temporary. But um, right then, I said, you know what? Bye. Erased her number. Blocked it. All of that. Done. And there was that. And guess who tried to pop up just a few months ago? Said friend. And guess what? Everything's rosy in her world. She's got a new man in her life. Everything's great. Work is going great. And I was just like, okay, well, it's been great. Done. And that was that. Right. Um, toxic. 
And again, because I rocked with her like in my 20s, I just, I don't know. I guess we used to have a lot of fun together. We used to hang out and stuff like that. And I, I just never saw it. Now, crystal clear. I want nothing to do with her. I won't tell her personally, but I'm just kind of doing, actually one of the articles um, talked about these successive approximations love it i think it was um the toxic relationships article successive approximations love this concept basically it means instead of if you know you have a person who you can't just go straight to and have a very adult conversation and say listen you've done xyz um this is not working for me i really don't want to have toxic situations people in my area cipher whatever I think we should not keep in touch anymore, right? You can't really go to everybody like that. And so this successive approximations thing is basically like, I guess some people would call it cowardly, but I like it in the sense that it's like you just little by little start to weed them out so that they get the point. So it starts with maybe you erase their number, you don't answer texts, you don't answer their emails, you don't um, they invite you to places, you just don't go. You always have an excuse. These kind of things start to annoy people. Not everybody. It doesn't work with everybody. But these kind of things start to annoy people and then they figure, you know what? She's not really that interested or he's not really that interested. I'm just going to move on and be done with it. But um, I think people find that cowardly. But I think you have to know who you're dealing with. You You just have to know. And... Not everybody is capable of hearing where they're at fault. That's number one. Two, they're not, um, if they're meaning you harm, they're definitely not willing to hear that from you. Some people you have to slowly, yes, right, yep. And, you know, like for me, I found it very easy to do with friends, right? So my whole thing is there's been like six to seven friends, people I consider friends that I, I just got rid of. And people often ask me like, hey, you know, maybe they're different now. Like, would you go back and be friends with them? And my answer is no. And I get this kind of pause or an answer like, well, why? And I'm like, I don't revisit people. Like I very rarely revisit people. So I always feel like if we stopped talking or if we stopped being friends, there was a good reason. And the way that the brain works is as time goes on, it kind of fades things. It fades situations and things that were egregious at one point don't feel that way or you tend to not remember what people did to you or what People, vice versa, people don't remember what they did to people. So I, not that so much that I harbor a grudge. It's not a grudge. Um, I certainly, you know, I won't be rolling my eyes and rolling my neck when I see people. It just means that I've moved on. And I always feel like if I've lost six people, there's another six people that I'm supposed to meet that I made space for. So I'm almost robbing myself in a sense of meeting some other great people at a certain point in my life by inviting old bad news back into my life. Something about that what's old is old and what's new is new and I just like to keep it moving forward and that's probably one of the biggest pieces of advice I want you to walk away from this Periscope with is um, some people do warrant a second look or maybe forgiveness and reconciliation and some people just don't deserve it. And I also feel like people are essentially who they're going to be. They are, especially if they're adults. Um, they're not just going to change. Usually for people to change, there has to be like some kind of catastrophe, like something catastrophic has to happen to them for them to make like a truly meaningful change. So to me, if you were a user like five years ago, you're a user today. I mean, you have to like really go to great lengths to like help me understand how that wouldn't be the case. You know, like if you had a bad temper three, four years ago, you probably still have a bad temper unless 
maybe you were damn near going to have a heart attack and that woke you up to the fact that you shouldn't get your blood pressure so high. I mean, like that kind of catastrophe has to happen for people to want to change. And my whole thing too now is like, I'm building a business. I don't have time for to wait for people to come up. So like, I'm not looking for perfection in the people that are in my circle. Most people know. Correct. And I always feel like if you don't deal with your demons, your demons will deal with you. That is a fact. People seem to think that they can like let their demons just go and sweep it under the rug and somehow it's going to magically get better. Not I, Letaria. I don't. I've been very honest. Like somebody asked me recently about a childhood friend who seems to be going through some turmoil and whether or not I would befriend her now that she's a mother and I'm a mom and all this kind of stuff. And I was like, honestly, I don't have the time or gumption to be the kind of friend she may need. Like I don't have, I'm not a wallower in sorrow. So not that I don't get sad, not that I don't occasionally cry or get down on myself, but I can't, I just can't afford to live there. I have three kids I'm living for. I have a business that I need to upkeep. So I can't afford to live in that space. So people who are stuck in that rut, I can't be friends with you. Not because I'm being mean. It's just not, I, it wouldn't be fair to her. And she's in a rut. She just wants to gossip and talk and complain. And I don't have time for that. Or the patience. I'm really, really at a point where it's like less is truly, truly more. Um, no, not for me, not for me at this point, you know, like, I don't want to hear your ghetto fabulous stories. I don't want to hear about, you know, this guy that you knew was terrible and, you know, you still dating him anyway, knowing he's got a whole family. I don't want I don't want to do those things. I don't. And I'll be, I'm being completely, for, <laughs> can't believe you laughing, but seriously, I, in my 20s, I used to be open to that. I used to be open to listening. Like, I wasn't open to the lifestyle, but I had friends that lived like that. I had friends that were dating drug dealers. Drug dealers, you know what I mean? I had friends who were dating married men. Right. Tyrone and them, okay? Tyrone, Pookie and them, all of that. Ain't nobody got time for that. I don't like I don't want to coax coach you on these things. And if I was coaching you about it 10, 15 years ago and we're in our mid 30s now, why am I coaching you about this now? Like growth. I know I've grown. I've learned things. So it's just it's not being judgy. It's just understanding like, you know, you move on, people grow up and you have different priorities in life. And I feel like when you invite certain things into your life, it takes a toll on you and it takes a toll on the things that you're trying to achieve. So, you know, for me, a lot of my energy is expended in my business. And so I just, you know, all of this is energy suckers. They just suck the life out of you, you know, like, when I have to spend time trying to figure out what your motivation is and you're a friend or a family member, we have a problem. We have a problem. Like, and let's talk about family for a second. So friends, whatever, one thing. To me, friends for me are always disposable. We don't share bloodline. You like are crazy, you're whatever, you're one of these 10 things that toxic relationships article mentioned, you can go, no problem. Family for me is a cornerstone. Very, very important to me is my family. So it's a little bit more touchy when we start to talk about toxic people in your family. It just is, right? Because now you're dealing with somebody you may have to see again. You're dealing with somebody you may have to deal with again, even if you decide to sever ties. That's touchy. But here's the thing. My thing is this. Love you. You're my family member. I can respect you when I see you. But if you're toxic, you have to go too. They have to go too. I've cut off quite a few family members 
for being one of each of these things. Either, you know, I've started the business and everything's like, oh, you have a business and oh, well, what is that about? And what do you even do? And that kind of, you know, like undercutting kind of stuff, you got to go. Or you want to have your hands in my life and you want to talk about what I'm supposed to be doing, but you don't even have all your life together. You got to go. I'll love you when I will love you from afar. <laughs> I'll love you from afar when we must meet at a funeral, a family get together. I will certainly respect you because you are owed that as somebody who shares the bloodline with me. But you do not have to be in my home. That's my rule. You do not have to be welcome in my home and you do not have to be in my life. And I've been very clear about that. And people are like, what? You do that with your family? Yep, sure do. Sure do. I feel like if I invite you in my home, it is a big thing, right? Because not everybody just traipses in and out of my house. So those that come, I, me, me the Letaria, when you come to my house, you have to respect me, right? And there are times, you know, like, yes, you would have like an aunt that you just know is a little flippant. And, you know, whatever. But she really means, well, fine. I'm not talking about those people. But I'm talking about the ones that will come in your house and be flippant with you. And even behind your back, they're talking crap about you. Yes, just because it's family. And I never, I just, I think that it's a very old school mentality. It's like, okay, it's your family. You know, you just deal with it. But what I see with older generations in my family is they all know who's toxic they all can't stand it, but they'd rather talk amongst each other about why the person's toxic and what they're doing. And nobody ever talks to the person about their behavior, like ever, or never shuts the person down for their behavior. And I find it fascinating. So my thing is, you know what, if that's what you want to do, if you're miserable in life, I'm sorry. I can pray for you. I'm a praying woman, right? So... I will pray for you. I will pray for anybody, quite frankly, as long as you don't have to be in my circle. So if you want to be toxic, fine. Live that way. You want to be miserable? Fine. I'm not here to fix anybody. Hence the reason I didn't take up clinical psychology in school. I did it for a semester and I left that crap alone because I don't want to diagnose people's issues. So, but like, if that's your issue, you need to go handle that. I'm going to pray for you to get to a place that, you know, provides harmony, peace, all the virtuous things in life. And then when you reach there, if you feel like you want to come back, you've learned some things, fine. We can reconcile. Like I said, for me, family is primary. So for family members, I am open to reconciliation under the right circumstances. But while you're trying to figure out your life or while you're being wild, crazy, nasty, toxic, you know, um, ill wishing, all of that, you got to go. So, I mean, literally, I kid you not, as it stands, there are quite a few people, immediate family and all, who are not allowed in my house. They cannot come to a birthday party. They're not invited to a barbecue. They cannot come sit at my dinner table until they change their behavior, literally. I don't feel any way about it. And I feel like the message I wanted to send tonight is that you can't be afraid to take that control back. You cannot be afraid because ultimately all you're going to do is get pulled into that downward spiral of being miserable and being toxic right with them. And that's what they want. If you're working towards something and it doesn't have to be a business, if you're just trying to live a life void of drama you just want to exist be happy thankful live through grace faith whatever it is for you you have to eliminate toxic people whether they be friends co-workers a job family they have to go it's like a bad aura like I don't know if any of you guys are in like into like feng shui or anything like that but like I believe in that stuff. I believe that the energy you surround yourself with 
is what ends up presenting itself in your life. And so when you surround yourself with bad negative energy, I truly believe that negative things happen or you can expect for that to happen. I don't think you can expect good things to happen. It's kind of like I plant, right? My husband and I plant. And so if I don't use good soil, if I don't put that plant in good soil, it's not going to grow. I can put as much fertilizer, as much water as I'd like. If the soil is bad, it ain't doing anything. It's not growing. It will stay. It will wither. It will die. The same is true for you. If you don't put yourself in an ecosystem, in a situation with good people, good people who have your back, who wish you well, they don't have to be perfect. This is not what I'm talking about. And I see like that overreactor deflector, they'll be the, they can't. They're, it's not possible for them. But like, see like that overactor deflector, they're the ones that, you know, will see like, oh, you're, you, you really want somebody that's perfect and there's no perfection anywhere. I've gotten that one. Oh, I'm not perfect. Nobody's perfect. Not even you're perfect, Janine. So I don't know what you're looking for. No, no, that's not what I said. You guys, I know you guys can hear very well. I've never said anything in this entire scope about perfection. They can be imperfect. We're all imperfect. I'm just saying quality. The quality of the person is what we're after. And you have to put yourself in quality soil. And that's what I choose. And I don't care. Like my group, my circle of trust, good, good friends that I've had for like years now are literally, I can count on my one hand. I can count on my one hand. And then there's like levels. So there's like my good, good friends that like know me, that I can lounge with them, like no makeup, chill. They know my house. They can come and do whatever, go in my fridge. Right. A bad day is one thing. It, listen, even a bad year is one thing, right? Everybody goes through stuff and I can understand it's a whole nother thing to be have a bad life I can understand if someone has wronged me or been toxic and we have a discussion and you say to me you know what Janine and this actually happened and I love this person to death for just being that candid you know what I was in a bad way at the time that we had those discussions and I don't really know what came over me um but I was in a bad way and I want you to know I apologize for whatever. You know, it just, that wasn't my character. I'm working on me and I can understand that. And in one situation, I had a conversation like that with somebody and I, they explained to me what was going on, what happened. And I completely got it. I was like, you know what? Enough. Like, you don't even need to apologize anymore. Like, don't even say sorry again. Like, it's fine. Water under the bridge, it happened, whatever. I'm just glad that you're better and I'm looking forward to build from here. So I'm not completely unreasonable in terms of re reconciliation, but you have to at least be the kind of person that's introspective enough to know that you've done something wrong. Like I have no problem apologizing if I've done something wrong. Even if it would burn me greatly to have to really come to you and apologize. I would apologize. It's not a problem for me. But I have a problem with people that can't admit when they're wrong. I mean, even if you, look, if you can't give me a real heartfelt apology, half-ass that shit, please. Give me a half-ass apology. I'll take a half-ass apology over none. But to not be a person that's capable of saying sorry or my bad, or whatever jargon you choose to use, I have a problem. That's just not the kind of person I can have hang around. I just can't do it. So that's my spiel. I mean, I hope that this is helpful because I feel like I know I'm not the only person that deals with toxicity and especially in families. I think that's a little bit of a touchy subject. Like, you know, nobody really wants people to know like what goes on in families, but we all know that like every family has their drama 
And, you know, how do you deal with that? You know, especially when you get to a point in life when you've decided like me, I've just really decided I want to be as happy as I can be for as long as I can be, right? Life is not like, you know, one big party every day. It just isn't. Sometimes it's going to be hard. Sometimes it's going to be sad. It's going to be a lot of different things. But I've decided I want to be as happy as I can be for as long as possible, when possible. And I don't need to be around people who don't want that for themselves. And I'm not trying to convince them either. Because you should, you know, like, I feel like it's a self-awakening thing. Like, I just like I had to self-awaken. I had things happen to me in life that brought me to that realization. Everybody has to go through the same thing. So, you know, take it for what it's worth. I hope anything I said was helpful to you with regard to toxic relationships. So, yeah, it's, I mean, it's not a easy thing to talk about, you know, and I think a lot of people are probably more reluctant to want to tell people to, you know, kick people to the curb. Um, they'll more keep them around because it's easy. It's easy to just put up with people and then talk behind their back, which is what a lot of people do. No, it's not hot. But most people would rather just talk crap behind people's back rather than tell them to their face and call them out on their crap. I've realized that. And so, like, I know I'm in the minority of people who will just call you on your crap. I don't have a problem. I'm known in my family. Like, when crap happens, when stuff goes down, everybody calls my house. They don't call my dad. They don't call my mom. They call me because they know I'm going to feel a way about it. And I'm going to be the one that's going to ultimately have the discussion, the difficult discussion with whomever it is that's, you know, infringed on family policy, I'm going to be the one that has that discussion. It's not a role I enjoy, quite frankly, but this is my plight in life. I, I seem I've kind of come to the realization this is my plight in life. So but, you know, if not for me, they would continue talking behind people's back, you know, and and fake in their face dealing with these people like just being fake. Oh, hey, hi. Happy Thanksgiving. Happy Christmas. You know, and then Merry Christmas rather. And then behind their back, they're talking all this nonsense about how horrible they are. It's just counterproductive and it is what it is. But I pride myself on being direct, not in a way to hurt. But if you're a pain, you have to be so good. Yeah. It <laughs> yes. I don't even know that I'm opinionated. I just, I, there's certain, you know, there's certain cornerstones for me. Respect. I'm very huge on respect. If you don't respect me, we have an issue. Um, you know, I don't like rude people. I don't like rude people. I don't like people that put others down and make them feel worse about themselves. I don't like those, those things are like deal breakers for me. I can deal with almost anything else. I can deal with a ditzy person who's a little flighty in the head. I have a friend now who I love dearly and she's like, I don't know how you deal with me. You know, I'm always all over the place. Thank you, Lataria. Um, She's like, oh, I'm always all over the place. How do you deal with me? And I'm like, you know, when it comes to like the greater evils of the world, being a little flighty every once and again or not being all there all the time that is so low on my list of priorities for anybody that's in my circle it's ridiculous because there's some days if you catch me I don't know what the hell's going on so who am I to judge so you know but those three things I mentioned respect rudeness you know putting people down to make yourself feel better I don't like those things at all and so you'll never ever see or hear me being in company with people like that I can see you hi how are you and that's it but those are not the kind of people I keep in my circle of trust so I hope that's helpful guys I hope it's helpful share it please share it with your followers and your network if you know people who are going through similar situations and can use this kind of talk please feel free to share I appreciate it um, just quickly before I let you go, let me let you know what's on the blog this week. 
So my blog for anybody that's new to the scope tonight is called The Aristocracy of HR. And this week I am talking about why it may be wise for you to reconsider befriending your boss. So I've had a few anecdotes lately about some conversations that kind of flew through the ether and got to the wrong people and therefore got certain people in trouble um, with the C-suite for, you know, different things getting out and so forth. And so it got me thinking, like, does it even make sense at all to befriend your boss? And my stance is it depends. It depends. Um, I personally have never been in a situation where um, I could get that comfortable with any one person. But I give some reasons, some things, some suggestions as to what you should be thinking about if that's something that you are thinking of doing because your boss is a heck of a nice person. So you can check that out at the aristocracy of HR.com. Um, and that's pretty much all I've got. Um, there is a new video up on my YouTube channel. You can check that out. It's a bit about me too, Lataria. What? What? Real hard. Real hard. When you catch yourself behind them closed doors and your boss is like, and you're like, dang, they cool. And you just like, pure trouble. Pure, pure trouble. So, yeah. I give some, all I do is I share and I give the warnings. Do with it what you will. But I learned the hard way too, Lataria. I'm not even going to lie. I definitely did. So, um, yeah, that's all I've got, guys. I hope you enjoyed the scope. I enjoyed you got my boss would cry. Right. Well, yeah, I talked about that. I talked about that. I had a I had a tearful boss. I had one that came to me like she was my girlfriend and we could just chit chat like that didn't bode well for me she ended up coming for me in time and it ended up being really ugly I've had such ugly situations I'm to the point before I let you guys go I'll say this one thing in ending I am to the point and thank god I work for myself where I don't trust anybody on the job now I will not I don't put that out in my articles because I don't want to scare people I try to do I try to give real accounts of what goes on and then I let you decide but personally me I don't trust anybody I've just been through too much and been burned too many times that it's very very hard for me to trust people in a workplace situation I'm very to myself let me do my thing hi good morning how are you and done you will know nothing about my life None of that. And I know that doesn't make for a very good coworker, but that's when you get burned, that's how you feel. And so nevertheless, thank God I work from, yes, compartmentalize. But thank God I work for myself. So if I don't like my boss, then there's an issue because the boss is me. So there you go. But thank you, Lataria. Dom Tillman, thank you. I think there was... Uh, Suarez Geo that popped on. Kimberly, thank you for the assist with all of the links and everything. I hope I got everybody that hopped on, but thank you so much. I really appreciate you guys tuning in and listening and sharing me and my thoughts with your followers. I really appreciate it because you don't have to care, but you do. And that's pretty cool. So I will talk to you guys next week. New topic, but have a great rest of the week. Take care. Bye.